I guess the core of it is you have a lot of interesting data. How can we make that actionable to our audience, right? So you're gathering a lot of interesting data. What are the things that people who are game makers and game marketers, how can they use that in a way that's impactful to their businesses? Yes. So with the kind of data that, for example, Game Tree collects, but is also, I believe, underappreciated, right now people are looking at a lot of demographics, game lists, in-game user behavior, but not a whole lot else. Whereas when you look at somebody's like core being, they're actually motivated by different things. They care about different kinds of rewards. And so building something that could either adapt to the kind of person, and it could be different scales. Like it could be as simple as just having two different options based on your two biggest demographics. Or if it's a giant studio, maybe you have like five or six different kinds of things where one person cares a lot about social status and like cares about prestige symbols. That kind of a person, you know, is going to care more about those things. And so you can give them to them more, advertise those more. Where somebody else who just cares about discovery and exploration, like maybe you don't drop those things because it's just going to annoy them and they're not going to engage with that kind of content. So in-game, you can optimize that way. Or even if you want to stick to one target demographic, then you could just sort of cut the things. Let's say you get a gamer DNA readout of your user base, and then also then you can sub-segment that to your best users. You could probably see differences in the gamer DNA of your best users compared to average ones. So you might want to lean more into the best users. And through that, you might discover new opportunities. For example, let's say self-expression is something that's pretty high, but you realize that your game doesn't actually have that much self-expression mechanisms. You might be like, oh, well, we're going to invest more into like a deeper character creator or fellowship. If that's high, you're like, oh, we should do deeper chat systems and such. So it can kind of be a map sort of how the movie and film industry is working now, where they use data-driven approaches to building these things. The game industry can do something like that as well, using game tree data or just their own surveys. From a marketing point of view, it's also about personas as well. For example, we have like hundreds of slides on Game Tree of our own users, the ones who have paid, translated the app in different languages or volunteer moderators, the highest levels that they reached in the app. And we can tell the differences between not just what all these people are like on all these questions that we have, but also how they compare to average users. So for example, we were pretty skittish about swearing because, you know, we're trying to be a friendly app for everybody. But it turns out that like our core demographic is actually pretty fine with swearing. So we're able to loosen up our language a little bit easier without being paranoid. That's a funny find. You talked about this thing of the gamer DNA. Like, can you talk about sort of what that is practically? Because I think you mentioned it, but I don't think you know the average users can know exactly what that is. Yeah, so it's actually a model that we developed. Originally, there was the aesthetics of play that was developed by some famous game designers that looked at gaming not as a category of genres, but of the types of fun that those games deliver. So for example, an RPG can be like anything, like it could be about challenge, it could be multiplayer, it could be single player, it could be all about the story. Like there's so many different kinds of RPGs that it's almost a useless term. But when you actually look at the types of fun that people like, that's a better way to categorize market, think about games. So on top of that, Quantic Foundry developed a gamer motivation model where they took it from uh, about seven or eight models to about 12. We also found that it could be a bit deeper and also a couple of things we wanted to reorganize. So we then developed our own version that has 20 different kinds of fun. So for example, like graphics, sound matter to some people, but not as much to others. And just being able to have a map or discovery, story, different kinds of elements. Like that. And then how exactly do you go about testing and identifying for that? How does that actually practically work? So in Game Tree, it's very easy to sign up, but we have all these optional tests that people take mm-hmm. because the more data they share with us, the better we can personalize their experience. And it could be the difference you know, between playing with people who are going to scream at you or tell you to kill yourself and meeting your next best friends. And so people are very incentivized to not only provide this data, but to do so honestly. We also make it kind of fun and rewarding for them to do so. And so it's basically surveys pointing out once we've developed a model, like how can we ask pointed questions around these? And so things can either be taken on a level of like a stat, for example, where some of the questions get merged into higher level questions or even just individual answers. For example, one of the questions we ask is, do I enjoy like honing noobs or something or like playing with an unfair power advantage? And certain games, like you see that spike up a lot higher than in similar games. Like if you look at like League of Legends and Dota, for example, you can tell a difference in demographics based on those kinds of questions that people answer. A lot of people like honing noobs. Yeah, that's actually, yeah. Score pretty high on that question. Yep. And then something interesting too is there used to be a giant debate about which one requires more skill. I think it's mostly settled now, but via game tree, you just look at the aesthetic or the DNA for challenge. And it turns out Dota players 
score higher on challenge than League of Legends players. So if the people that play the game are a representation of the game itself, it's pretty mathematically objective that the people who like more challenge play Dota, and then the conversations just solve. That's super interesting. Yeah, it's super funny. We talked about this matchmaking a lot. I know that's somewhere you've had a background in. Can you talk a little bit about how important matchmaking is to game companies and like how to actually do it well? In a lot of ways, that's sort of the core premise of what you're working on. Yeah, so I was just at a private event with a lot of the top matchmaking people in the industry, for example, with like StarCraft, League of Legends and such, like the people in charge of those spaces. And matchmaking was the biggest focus of the conversation. And the biggest theme was that, like I said earlier, the studios sort of accidentally broke communities by doing instant queue matchmaking, where the main factors are your skill level and your availability. There's a lot of interesting stuff beyond that. It's a pretty deep space, but... What's being missed completely is who somebody is as a person. And from our research, not everybody, but everybody to some degree, but some people primarily care more about playing with somebody who they actually are going to like rather than playing with like the fastest queue or the most exactly matched skill level. We just did a video on this in collaboration with Extra Credits. If you type in YouTube like Extra Credits Gamer Loneliness, for example, they found it pretty interesting because they're large thought leaders on game design and development basically diving into how studios can consider, for example, people's personal values. That's the number one predictor of a friendship. It's not play style in the games and personality. It's, do I find this person to be moral? And without that there, like no matter how well you get along, if you don't find them as a moral person, it's hard to be friends with them. So for example, in Game Tree, we actually collect data on like how okay is this personal feminism with gay people and such. Not that we create bubbles, but it all goes into a giant collage So for example, if one person's like extremely one side and one person's extremely another, then it's less likely they're going to match. And so in a way, it's kind of creating a safe space, but not like at the same time creating bubble effects or filtering people, hard filtering on just like single criteria. One other question I had, one of the segments that we work with a lot is Web3. And so to what extent are you seeing the Web3 audience embrace platform? And what are some of the pain points that you're solving with the Web3 space in in particular? Yeah, so we just added Web3 as a platform. We've been talking to a lot of Web3 companies. It turns out that most of the things about Game Tree are extra relevant to Web3. It wasn't our initial assumption, but just the pain points are sharper. For example, Game Tree, which is a link with Game Tree button, can provide huge amounts of user data on their community. We can also provide it if people just ask us to query stuff, but if it wants to be individually identifiable, we want permission from the users. Web3 knows almost nothing about Web2. That's a giant problem in the space. But being able to know all of the games and how much they like those games, even with ratings and reviews, can give very, very, very accurate portraits of like, okay, we're trying to get users. Where should we be looking? And you can even look at competitors' products and what their audiences are, for example. So by being able to understand those things, you know, who to partner with or like how to advertise. Additionally, Web3 lives and dies by the community. The stickiness of tokens, the stickiness of games, the value of like NFTs and such is so highly correlated with the community. And if people don't find friends, then they're not going to stick to communities. And if you look at Discord, for example, yeah, there's communities, but it's hard to individually connect with people, hard to know out of these people who's actually looking for friends or who would you get along with. Or who do you have more in common with outside of the game? So Game Tree has been an interesting opportunity for them to solidify those communities by being able to say like, okay, here's a game I want to match with other people who play this specific game who I'm most likely to be real life friends with. A last component is user acquisition. A lot of sources like Google and Facebook don't allow ads, of course. So being able to receive input on who exactly target users are that allows us to send those exact kinds of users and even better if they've had anybody link with Game Tree because then we can hyper, hyper, hyper target. So just the kinds of people who we know are going to love the game are going to be the ones going over there. The work is really exciting that you're doing with Game Tree, John, and, and before that with the uh, February 12 types because the type of marketing our team does, it's very data focused. It's always trying to find like the optimal set of eyeballs for the marketing and bring the right user into the funnel. And the more blind and broad that is, like generally the less effective your marketing efforts are in general, both paid ad spend and just how you're spending your time and resources. So at this point, uh, user acquisition performance marketing industry is pretty mature in a lot of ways, but there's also a lot of sameness to the targeting methodologies based on like specific actions or based on like self-identified traits or boxes someone checks when they sign up for a social network. And I think 
this type of very database persona based targeting, it's just the tip of the iceberg that we're exploring with the kind of work that you're doing here. And it's making my mind go to a lot of places about how this can be leveraged for more nuanced and non duplicative targeting tactics to get the optimal users for marketers. So I'm really excited about both the research and as the product continues to evolve. So thanks for spending this time with us. Oh yeah, we're, we're very excited to be working with more partners in this space. We've been very B2C focused, optimizing the value proposition to the users and the data collection there. But you're right, there's so, so, so much opportunity there that we're looking forward to unpacking. Absolutely. And before we wrap up, is there anything that you didn't get to talk about that's important or exciting about where you're building GameTree that you think our listeners should also know about? I think from a user point of view, we're really trying to create a world that's just more fun and meaningful in gaming. We're all outside of high school, college age, where a lot of people stop gaming because it's hard to find people to play with or it seems like a waste of time. But if gaming is used as a tool to hang out with friends and stay in touch with loved ones, then suddenly that's productive time. So we're trying to create more of that in the world as a company mission is just making it like faster and easier to connect and make those gaming experiences like memorable stories, not just something fun that happens and then disappears into the void forever. Uh, so we're really trying to become sort of some like water or air between these gaming platforms that have these isolated ecosystems so that people can come together easier and solidify around these experiences and their tribes. Well, John, really appreciate you taking the time to join us and talk a bit about all the stuff you're working on. If someone wants to get a hold of you or learn more about GameTree, either as a consumer or in a business context, how can they do that? Yeah, so uh, my email is juke at gametree.me, and they can always look up gametree.me or 512types.com for that test. That's starting to go through more development now as well. And then, of course, being able to Google GameTree or search on LinkedIn. Most people can probably figure that one out. Awesome. Warren, do you want to take us out? Yeah, John, this was a pleasure. It's really cool to go deeper into the psychology behind why players do what they do and also what we're all looking for as gamers from a, like a social and human connection standpoint. So thanks so much for your time, man. I would watch the YouTube video. If you haven't, I enjoyed that quite a lot because the extra credit guys are awesome. Perfect. And thank you to everyone who checked out the episode today. As always, this is brought to you by our team here at Uptick. Here at Uptake, we do all things to help games grow. So we help with the growth marketing, the creative development, the data science behind all of that, and try to be a one-stop shop for effective data-driven growth of all kinds across gaming. So if you are building a cool game of any type, we'd love to meet you, learn more about what you're building, and see if we can help with any of the challenges that you're working on for growth. You can reach us through our website. That's uptick.com, U-P-P-T-I-C.com. Awesome. Talk soon.